it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Dan McCombie to B Lab, uh, partly because I've heard about the stupid Runa tea from Danny for years. And yet you haven't tried it yet? And yet, I, well, it's not about that, it's about I haven't met you before. So this is, uh, this is closing a big, long loop where, uh, because uh, you'll hear from, from Dan that he started his venture while a student here at Brown in Danny's class. Uh, I'm now also teaching Engine 1010, and uh, I don't have a Runa in my portfolio yet, so I'm bummed. Wow, you got time? I got time. I hope I hope I can get a couple of Runas out the door. And you also have Sir Kensington's in your portfolio. Right? I have no Sir Kensington's yeah. in my portfolio yeah. yet. But, like, do you have any bridge though? <laughs> That's a personal question. So anyway. Uh, Dan McCombie is the founder of Runa T, and he's uh, has no slides. He's going to take you on his entrepreneurial journey, sort of starting at Brown and moving forward, right? Amen. And he's going to be telling it like it is. So take good notes, and uh, there'll be time to pestering with questions, I'm sure, at the end. So, oh, plenty, plenty. All right, take it away, Dan. How y'all doing today? Good, right? All right, all right, I like the enthusiasm. Um, I'd love to get to know all of you a little more. So quick show of hands, how many of you are Brown students or went to Brown? Right on. How many of you are members of the GCB? The rest of you will get to know it. One of my favorite spots in the world. Um, how many of you are from Rhode Island? Right on. How many of you are from the East Coast? Midwest? Yeah, that's what I like. I like Danny, I'm also from Cleveland. Uh, how many of you came from all the way out west? And how many of you have the same idea that you started the program with? Wow. All right. So a little evolution. There you go. And how many of you are working in, on projects or businesses with physical products? Okay. That's good. This will be relatively relevant. I'm going to apologize in advance. I am not, a, I like tech. I use tech. I'm holding a phone. I'm not a tech guy, so if you want to hear about like software as a service or uh, funnels or all that, I have plenty of friends I can introduce you to. Um, so I'm, as as they said, I'm gonna be telling it like it is. Um, my, the general premise I have here is this is all the things that I wish somebody who had been standing in this position for me had told me over the years. So this is gonna be interactive. This is gonna be dynamic. I've given myself notes because I'm trying not to ramble, but if I do. Feel free to interrupt me. More importantly, if you've got questions, like a burning question, I'll leave plenty of time at the end, but if there's something that comes up you want to hear about, feel free to raise your hand, interact. This is not going to be a super formulated lecture. This is about us learning from each other and me sharing you with you the things that not just I, but all the people I've met, worked with, learned from, and advised have shared, me along, shared with me along the way. Um, but it's really good to be back here. I don't think I've been on campus for a year or something like that. I went to every graduation and campus dance and all that until my five year. I, um, I'm almost on my 10 year. I'm turning 32 next week. So feeling, feeling young. Um, but I really love Brown. Brown not only launched my whole career. Um, little known fact, I was a marine biology major. The last thing I expected to do was start a tea company. Um, but also the, the values of this place deeply inspired who I am. I think you are all, in whatever form you're here on campus today, be it this program or at RISD and interacting or students here, you all are incredibly blessed. I'm sure most of you know it, but over the course of the next chapter of your life after you graduate, I hope you see like I did just how much the, the values of inquisition, connection, authenticity, interaction, and intellectual curiosity have really driven and made me who I am. Um, I'm also, just to say it on camera, but truly, uh, being able to start the company in my last semester, literally as it was fall of 2008, as the economy was going down the tubes, and to see how my life worked out is a blessing. Um, and I'm so grateful to Danny and this program as it's evolved into what it is now for the opportunity I've been given. Um, but yeah, like I said, the last thing I expected was that I was going to start an Amazonian tea company. Uh, it turned into an idea in Danny's class, and I can tell a little bit of the story in a second, into literally the entirety of my 20s, or my adult 20s, uh, and it truly changed my life. And one thing I will share with you for sure is, some of you I'm sure will start the businesses you're working on. Some of you may end up starting a different business full time. Some of you may not start a business ever or not for 10 years or 20 years. And that's okay. The experience you get and the learnings you get from this 
intellectual inquiry and exercise for, for me to reflect have carried me so deeply into who I am and changed my life forever. And I think that through this process of learning from each other and inquiring with each other, you all gain a lot as well. Um, but life doesn't come with a playbook. It certainly didn't work out like I planned. And there's a lot of things that I picked up along the way. So briefly, I'll just share my background. Like I said, I grew up in the woods outside Cleveland. I was obsessed with hiking and nature, and I was literally that kid picking frogs out of the pond when, up until I was like a senior in high school. So I was positive I was gonna go be a marine biologist. That's one of the big reasons I came to Brown. That and my college guidance counselor made me flip a coin between Wesleyan, so I'm glad it came up heads. Um, so I came to Brown and I was super passionate about ecology and the way that humans can interact with and support living systems. And up until my junior year, I was positive that I was gonna go work in a lab, be a marine biologist, end up working in conservation, maybe end up, I don't know, running the Nature Conservancy or something. And then I decided to take a semester off. And that was for various reasons, but I largely felt that for the experiences I wanted to have and the connections I wanted to have with other cultures, I couldn't do that by going to what would have been my study abroad of working in a lab in Costa Rica. So I ended up traveling to South America. I went all the way from the Andes up from Ecuador all the way down to Chile. And part of that trip, I actually spent some time volunteering in the rainforest in Ecuador with the same communities that Runa ended up work, some of the same communities Runa ended up working with. And through that experience and planting trees and learning from and with those communities, I recognized the deep, deep connection that they had to their ecosystems. And more importantly, as much as this is all in vogue now, the real potential and possibility for business to be a force for social, ecological, and economic good. So I came back to Brown, all hopped up on my inspiration, and I changed everything. I still love marine biology, love ecology, finished my degree, super proud of that. But I knew that working in a lab for the rest of my life wasn't gonna be the answer for me. So classically Brown, I ended up taking something like 35 classes in 17 different departments. And one thing led to another, and I ultimately ended up taking Danny's class. And again, flash forward, because I'd taken a semester off, this was fall of 2008, we had to, I ended up taking the class, and we ended up having to pair up in teams the first day. This wasn't like you guys who came in here with at least some semblance of who your team or your idea was. We had to pick our friends. I looked over and I saw Tyler, who was my best friend from freshman year. I was like, you, we're gonna write this plan together. And so through the course of the class, we ended up throwing around a bunch of ideas. Some of them were, actually most of them were really bad ideas. Some of them were bad ideas that ended up turning into good ideas when somebody else started them. But what we landed on was this amazing, weird, hard to pronounce leaf called guayusa that Tyler had first encountered in his work with indigenous communities in Latin America. What is this guayusa, you say? So he'd encountered it getting up, dr drinking with these communities early in the morning when they shared their myths and their stories and their legends. Guayusa was a central part of the lives of the Quechua communities and many others, the Quechua who we mainly have worked with. And they get up and they sit around the fire and they transmit their culture. They interpret their dreams. They learn from each other. It's what brings them together as a community and as a people. And it's what makes them what they call Runa, fully alive. So trying this, starting to write this business plan, going through all the stuff that you guys just saw up on the screen, we ultimately recognize that this was really something that fit into our ideas for how we wanted to create change in the world. But also, the more advisors we talked to, the more people said, all right, you hippies, this is cool, good business plan, you'll probably get an A in the class, which fortunately we did. But more importantly, this is a real business with a real opportunity. The Guayusa leaf, for those of you not familiar with it, it's like a tea, but unrelated. It's got an incredibly smooth, clean taste, as much caffeine as a cup of coffee, twice the antioxidants of green tea. And like I said, it comes directly from this rich history and ecological tradition of the Quechua and other communities in Ecuador. So we basically looked at each other, looked at our job prospects, looked at the falling stock market indexes, and said, screw it. And we moved to Ecuador in 2009. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second, because that's a, that's a nice sounding story. And I could tell you, which it did, that everything worked out great. We're now in 10,000 stores. We're a large company. 
I rode off into the sunset with the love of my life and found all of the joy and everything I wore in the world and I have hundreds of millions of dollars in my bank account. It's not exactly how it all works out. I don't have hundreds of millions of dollars in my bank account. What I learned along the way was the most important part of the journey. The things that I saw and learned from working with communities, building a partnership, funding a company, making a boatload and more of mistakes along the way, that's what really made me who I am today. And that's the, if there's one thing I can impart upon you, it's that throughout the process of starting a business, writing your plan, growing, learning, the spirit of inquiry and the spirit of what I like to call beginner's mind is something that will carry you throughout the way. Always being open to the learnings and the opportunities and the teachings that experiences can give you, if you can keep that one thing in mind, that will probably be the best thing I could impart on you today. So, things I'm gonna share. What it actually is like to start a company. Some of the things I learned on the way, like I said. The things that nobody told me, but I wish they had. More importantly, the things people did tell me, but that I refused to listen to. Um, and I could break it out by category. I could literally spend three hours here talking in front of you. I'm gonna spare you that. But I am gonna kind of go through some of the big buckets of lessons and learnings and growth that we had to try to keep it relatively cogent. And like I said, I will keep plenty of time at the end for questions. And actually, if someone in the back, you could raise your hand when it's about 11.15, 11.30, just to give me a little wave, I'd appreciate that. So let's dive right in. First and foremost, one thing that I'm very fortunate that I had thought about but continued throughout the course of time is the big question of why you're doing this. And that may seem really simple and obvious, but I talk to literally hundreds of entrepreneurs a year. I probably get an email in my inbox from someone trying to start a beverage or a food company two to three times a week. And I do go out of my way. I talk to almost all of them. And I have, by the way, I have a whole essay I've written on the best way to manage sort of introductions and mentor-mentee relationships that I can gladly send out. I'll spare you that part right now, but I wrote that on a rant on a plane after a few too many not super effective introductory emails. But the big question you need to ask yourself is, what are your main motivations for doing this? Starting a company is really cool, and it's all in the press, and you'll probably be an Instagram star, but it's not glorious. The, the images that you see and the pictures that people, even like myself, paint are often not what's actually going on under the hood, because so much of presenting yourself as a leader and an advocate and so on and so forth requires keeping your best foot forward. So I'm gonna take that foot back. I'm gonna look under the hood a little bit here and think about a few things. One, what change do you really wanna create in the world? Making a product is nice, making a product people will buy is even better, or a service, but to keep you motivated over the, I promise you, twice as long as you think it's gonna take you to sell this or do whatever your exit is or your long-term goal, if you, you need to have that North Star, that thing that reminds you what about this matters and what do you hope to do in the world. And that can be, if you really are passionate about the efficiency of IT systems and you really care about that, and I know plenty of people who do, that's awesome. If in my case, it's about how do we reframe the relationship between livelihoods, ecology, and communities, which continues to drive my work today, that's great too. And as a side note, and I'll go into this later, if you feel like what you're doing at your company is no longer in alignment with that great change or that calling that you've iterated and can evolve over time, that is always, always a point to stop and ask yourself some of the hard questions. Relatedly, does the world really need what you are trying to create? Not, can you sell this? Not, will people buy it? Is this something that people out there truly can find making a difference in their lives? I forget the name of the book, I should remember it, but it's one of the first books Danny had us read in his class. And there's one core principle that I've probably shared in almost every class or every talk I've given, which is for any business or product or service to be successful, it needs to have an overt benefit, a dramatic difference, and a real reason to believe. And that's a pithy one-liner. The book probably could have been reduced just to that, and that's the message I remember. But it's really true. Your product or service or community or whatever you're making can, should, and hopefully will really have something that benefits people, really be distinct from what else is out there, and be a, have something for people to get behind, something people align with, something that makes it sticky, that stays with people. As I said earlier, and really want to reiterate, 
This could go on for way longer than you're expecting. Could also, I mean, you could sell it in two years, that's happened too. But are you ready to commit the unforeseeable future to this? It's rarely a good look for a founder to bail on a startup or step out of it early. Sometimes it's absolutely the right decision and don't be afraid of that if the writing's all on the wall. But we thought we were gonna get Runa to be a $70 million company by 2013 and we were gonna go just like Honest Tea and unsurprisingly and totally understandably, that's not exactly how it worked out. And it went from four and a half to five to ultimately seven years of my life and I'm still actively on a relatively different level involved today. It's part of who I am, it is part of my DNA. I still meet people who literally would be like, oh, you're the Runa guy. They often mistake me for Tyler because we, I think, look pretty different, but I still am the Runa guy, one of them, and I will be for the rest of my life, along with, I must add, Charlie, our third co-founder, who's also a rock star. Um, and you need to think about the fact that this may end up, as you already know and why I asked that question up front, this may end up being something very different than you imagine it. That's what a pivot is. And so you need to also think through how does this fit into the life you want for yourself? I'll go into that more later. Okay, so we've now talked about the why. Let's talk about the how, the what. The, how do you get this going? Um, one of the top level things, by the way, side note, who here is actually writing a page by page business plan? Yeah, people don't really do those anymore. Every business I've looked at starting now, you just have a deck and a financial model which frankly is kind of great. Doing 50 pages of text writing, people often don't read it. Um, so one of the things that I really came to recognize is it's not just about your plan, but planning about how you're going to make decisions. What is your process? How do you go, up, go about deciding things? How do you go about recognizing that new information has changed your premise or your overall proposition? And how do you incorporate that? I'll go into this more talking about partnership, but how do you communicate with the people you work with? How do you make decisions with them? How do you create systems for holding yourself and your team accountable and connecting with the people in your community because they're the ones who grow you forward? Um, as it goes into like the specifics of any business model though, I will give a few concrete tips. One, don't make the mistake that I still make today, which is learn how to use Excel on a Mac. My finance friends still give me a lot of crap for that. Um, but also, even as you're building out your revenue and your financial model, I literally spent five sleepless nights planning out every detail of our possible sales model, because I am OCD probably, and so much of that ended up not being true. So throughout the course of planning, you will often, and this is a maxim that I'm sure all of you have heard, you will often make perfect the enemy of good. I highly, highly encourage you to resist that temptation. You cannot plan everything out. You need to plan out the basics of what your revenue model is, the basics of how much money you're gonna need, but especially because since all of you are relatively early in your careers, I'm guessing most of you don't have extensive backgrounds in the industry you're likely going into, you need to bake in the fact that you're going to learn a lot more about how your company and your industry does business and incorporate the refinement of your knowledge and the refinement of your business model into that business model. So I encourage you not to go crazy planning everything. Get enough detail to be legitimate credible, raise money if you need to, and set yourself up to continue planning going forward. Um, and then, I mean, I could go on for many more questions about planning, but what I will say, and I see too often, is make sure you actually have a revenue model, first of all, even if it's not a firm set thing, at least know what it'll look like. Make sure you have a clear sense of how you're going to launch products, where you're gonna roll them out, and a sense, particularly, this is one that got us, is what is your operations and your production and your cost of goods going to look like? That was the area we were most in the dark and it drives everything. I'm sure you've all learned about you know, cost-based pricing versus price-based costing, et cetera, et cetera. But we were very much noobs when it came to planning out what it actually took to produce a beverage. And that drastically changed our projections and our costs and even the amount of money we raised over time. I mean, even today, as I talk to beverage entrepreneurs, to start a beverage company and do your first production run, it can easily run into the six figures, no problem. That's not a very bootstrappable model. And planning ahead for that is really critical because otherwise you might go out and raise $50,000 in pre, pre, seed, pre, I don't even know, they didn't even have those terms when we started Runa. But 
that ended up coming to bite us in the butt a little bit, and we had to go out and raise the capital we needed right before we went into a production run. So those are the kinds of things to think ahead of. OK, so you've all got your business plans, right? You've got it all figured out, ready to go raise the money. How do you decide to actually take the leap, and what are the factors to keep in mind when you do? One, please, as a favor to me and your family and your friends and the world, no matter how excited you are, before you really go into this, take some time. Take a weekend, take a long walk, do, do a whiteboard, do the pros and cons, and make sure you really feel comfortable signing up for what you're signing up for. For you, all of you who've already chosen to sign up for this program, I'm assuming that's going to be a yes. But you'll remember that moment. I'm, as a side note, I'm big in sort of imagery-based meditation and setting, goal setting and mindfulness. And so you'll probably, especially because I'm saying it now, that moment where you sit and you write down all the, the reasons why and your goal, you're going to remember this moment, you remember that. And that's probably going to be a moment that will stick with you for the next five years of your life. I still have the most vivid of memories of the moment that I came up to the team and said, OK, guys, I'm going to do this. And that was right the day I booked my ticket to Ecuador. And that memory will stay with me for the rest of your life. And that is something that will continue to inspire you as you grow this company. Um, and so there's this kind of balance where you, know, you don't know everything. And that's great. There's a lot of people who hold themselves back from their dreams because they don't have all the answers or the knowledge. And I definitely support just going for it because I definitely did not know what it took to run a beverage company when I started it. But also, on the flip side, you know, there's the Forbes 30 under 30. You're in this college program. There's this whole vogue of people who are starting companies young and ambitious go-getters. I'm going to do you all a solid here. I'm going to take that weight off your back. It is awesome if you start your companies in college. So deeply support that. But you don't have to. If this idea doesn't turn out to be the right one, that's OK. If you start your company at 24 or 29 or 31 because you have the idea that really drives your passion, that's way better than doing it because you feel like you have to now. And as a side note, as uh, Scott may have mentioned last week, not all entrepreneurs start their company immediately when they have the idea. Some people take time to go out and get a job and raise some money to support themselves. We weren't able to pay ourselves for the first six months of the company, and that was, I would like not to do that again. Let's put it that way. So just because you have a burning great idea doesn't mean you have to go out and do it right now. Take the time you need to be in a place where you're ready to do it, and that may end up serving you really well. But other times, you may need to get on it because you have a great idea and a great opportunity, and you don't want to miss that. I don't have that answer for you, but balancing both of those things in your mind and in your decision-making process can be immensely helpful to always keep those there as you plan this and go forward. All right, so you're starting this business. You probably have a partner. Uh, there are some great companies that start with a sole founder, but I do highly, highly encourage starting with a partner. Um, if any of you are really adamant you shouldn't, I'm happy to talk to you after, and I'll try to share with you why I think that's not the best idea. But I know some who've been very successful that way. But if you have a partner, and I've seen this in many, many circumstances, setting the roadmap and the ground rules and the structure for your partnership, both financial and equity and communication and relational, will save you so much headache and create so much opportunity for growth over the course of your partnership together. Because remember, no matter if it's your best friend from your dorm freshman year, in my case, or someone that you met this week, if you're going to be successful, you're going to be in this for a long time. I've always joked, Tyler is the closest thing I've ever had to a wife, and we've never once been involved. So you're going you're gonna to be really, really directly connected to this person for the rest of your life. And you're going to need to think through a number of critical things. One, roles and contributions. I'm not talking about title. People spend way too much time on titles. I have myself. I can gladly talk about that. But I mean, what are your strengths, each of you? How does that align with your passions? The two might not be the same. I'm pretty great at operations. I do it in a pinch. I'm often the guy who plans birthdays and weekends and events. But that's not actually what I love doing. It's just a pigeonhole that I sometimes and often fall into. And through the course of Runa, we create an alignment where, OK, yes, I was generally the person most responsible for that. 
but also knowing that I love com communications and sales and brand building and strategy. You have to create that intersection and that nexus of how do you people do the things they're best at? How do individuals have an opportunity to learn and grow from each other? And how do you create that balance where people have clear responsibilities, but also are, you all are growing and learning with each other? Because you all will do many things throughout your life. I could name the list of all the part-time gigs I have right now, and those all fit different buckets in what I love. So making sure that you have that communication is really critical. Um, one book that actually, this is gonna sound a little, little funny, but trust me on this one. This is much more for intimate and romantic partnerships. But there's a book called The Five Love Languages. Have any of you heard of this? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not surprised it's only the women in the room who have. But the whole concept of this book is that it's about how do people naturally communicate with each other? And although some of the concepts in this book only apply to intimate partnerships, the premise of people like to hear different things, be it words of affirmation or acts of service or gifts. And those are the ways people love to see respect and love and affirmation really matter. And so recognizing however it is that you communicate with each other and prefer to communicate is a huge benefit to y'all. Doesn't mean you all have to communicate in your partnership in the same way, but knowing how other people like to be spoken to and like to be heard is critical. I highly recommend all of you read this book. Um, relatedly, what is your understanding for how you communicate and make decisions? It's gonna change, but having a roadmap for how you decide tough issues, how you communicate with each other, and how you, how you continue to learn from and grow through each other, with each other through the course of your business will serve you immensely well. So for example, Tyler and I, we had weekly check-ins. We would often, partly because he's one of my best friends separately from Runa, we would go get dinner together and not talk about business. We usually ended up talking about business, at least some part of it. But making sure you create the rituals and the structures and the basis of an underlying relationship of trust is deeply critical. And that goes from how do you actually have in your founding documents what your decision-making process is to, like I said, the more personal stuff. Um, relatedly, um, just as a basic premise, I highly, highly as a human value authenticity and empathy. And creating a space for having an open communication around those core values really, in my opinion, fuels the potential of a strong partnership. You don't all have to set that, but I frankly think every good company should have that at some level. Uh, we can see plenty of famous examples of companies that have failed for lack of that. And whatever it is your pathway for directly relating to and, and keeping each other honest and real, set that clearly, explicitly, and openly up front and continue to check in on that. Um, relatedly, make sure everyone is aligned with their incentives and communicate that. Things change. Your compensation, your relationship, your structure, that may no longer, as you evolve, fit with what you set yourself up for. And it's scary to have that conversation, to go to your business partner and say, you know, and I'll talk more about this in a sec, you know, the equity structure we had maybe made sense for how we thought this was gonna work out, but I'm contributing this or that. Have that conversation with your partner. You may not get the answer you want, but you're gonna regret not saying something. Think it through, be thoughtful, be mindful. I actually highly encourage before you send emails, and by the way, emails, as I've learned to my final, final, final growth, emails are probably not the best way to communicate tough issues or emotional issues. I highly encourage phone or, because we lived in two different countries, Skype. Our joke was always that we actually lived in a box in the corner of each other's computer screen. Um, but whatever your methodology is, you're always, as long as you're thoughtful and considerate about it, better off having the tough conversations than sitting on them. Um, and just as much as there's a process for accountability, create a process for celebration. Celebrate successes. I literally have our success permanently ingrained in my skin because I got a tattoo of the Guayusa leaf when we reached a million dollars in sales. I'm not saying you all should get tattoos, but whatever your celebration is, be that you know, a dinner when you reach a milestone, or just acknowledging each other, thanking each other. Those little things and those celebrations are critical for carrying you through the oftentimes grinding process of starting a company. Similarly though, measurable metrics to hold each other accountable are critical. Whatever it is, and there's various ways of doing it, but 
a weekly check-in, KPIs, OKRs, whatever acronym you want to create that you took from Google or the movie Office Space. Anyone, who have seen Office Space? Oh, I feel old. Go watch Office Space. It's one of the best movies of all time. Just trust me on that. Um, so it's really critical to have some level of quantifiable accountability. But the tricky balance is also make sure that you're not doing too much of it. Because there's a, a challenge in overdoing that in a way that can take the joy out of a partnership. And it'll evolve, and as the company gets bigger, and you have more team, and you'll need to be holding other people accountable, that will get more and more important. But phase it in in a way that feels good to y'all. Okay, so you've planned your company, you've got your partnership set up, now the fun part, equity. Everyone's favorite conversation. Um, and it's never an easy one, and everyone has a different opinion. I have lots of friends, and I do a lot of informal career coaching, who go join tech startups, and they're like, oh my god, I'm the second employee, and the founder's giving me 2%, which boggles my mind sometimes. I don't work in tech, so there's obviously differences to that. But whatever it is, there's a balance of fairness and standards, and those meet somewhere. And the critical thing I'll say is, whatever decision you and your partner or your team make, ultimately it's your decision. Yes, your investors matter, yes, your advisors matter, but first and foremost, to have a growing, successful partnership and business, you need to feel good about that for y'all selves. And a critical thing to that point is, what you bring to the table is essential. Do you bring funding connections? Did you have the initial idea? Does your grandfather own a grocery, this is not what actually happened at Runa, but does your grandfather own a grocery store that can launch all your products? That latter one, I don't know if that should be credited with equity. But whatever you bring to the table matters, but it's not everything. What also matters is, how is this gonna grow and evolve? You're gonna be in this for seven, 23, 50, probably more like seven years, and thinking about how do you incentivize yourselves and each other over the course of the business, is essential. That also involves vesting and structures to make sure that if something doesn't work out, you have an agreement about that. But those kinds of things are really, really hard to come to a conclusion on afterwards. One of my, probably my best friend in the world right now, he's going through this. He, uh, he started a, a, vi a video content series and he forgot to have a contract with his videographer when he started. And even though it was his idea and he did all the script, he now owes his videographer money just to get his video back. And he learned that lesson. Fortunately, it wasn't an expensive lesson. There's a critical balance between not being uptight about papering everything up, that can sometimes take the joy out of it, but anything that you think could be an issue, and especially anything that your advisors or people tell you could be an issue, and side note, go ask about that. Have some agreement about how it works out. A Couple other points on equity. Um, you know, the money you bring to the table, that's money. Whatever your pre-money valuation or your convertible note is, that's what you get credit for. I have plenty of people who have come to me and said, oh yeah, you know, I'm investing the first capital and I should get extra credit for that. Like, yeah, you're taking a risk. You should get credit for your risk. If someone's taking a lot more risk, that deserves some sort of recognition. But you're also getting a chunk of the company for that money. So I often am a little skeptical of founders who come and say they get an extra 10% of the company for having brought in the first round of capital. You're all gonna be, hopefully, busting your butts to bring in capital over the course of the company. Goes back to my earlier point. So relatedly, but important enough to, in my mind, be in a separate subject, is advisors. How many of y'all have found advisors for your company already? Awesome, awesome. And how many of you feel like there's a clear and meaningful contribution from that advisor that you're hoping for? Okay, great. That's the general point. Advisors are great. They make your, they give you credibility. And that's important. And there are some cases where advisors who won't be super involved are good just for having their name as lending legitimacy to your company, which of course, you all know you're super legitimate anyways. But we, I would highly encourage you with advisors to have a clear understanding, one, what are they bringing to the table? If you think that in our example, we thought they'd help us find sales accounts, have that explicit conversation with them. You might not be able to put that in paper, but have that understanding. Um, if it's they're going to give you strong legal advice because they're a lawyer, great, that should be clear. How much time are they contributing? 
That's really important. Um, you know, I've, I'm on a m number of advisory boards and some of them I talk to half an hour a week, once or twice, so some of them I've had to say like, listen, team, if you were getting to a point where actually this is taking up more of my time than I felt was agreed to, we need to come to some sort of understanding. And we did, we ended up adding on my time as a consultant. But whatever it is, have a clear understanding and ultimately with advisors, it's going to be on you. I can promise you advisors are not gonna be calling you up very often asking for the opportunity to give your advice, their advice. You need to maintain a, cons a consistent, constructive, and proactive dialogue with your advisors and ultimately your investors as well. Um, another thing I'd add is get to know them first. Spend a little time talking to them. Yeah, their time is worthwhile. They'd like to not spend a ton of time just doing the get to know you chats, but make sure you have a sense of their personality. Talk, and this applies across the board, talk to other people who knew them or know them or have worked with them to get a sense of how they best contribute and share their advice and insight. And like I said, with partners in equity, have a clear understanding for what happens if they end up not being the best fit. We had some advisors, frankly, who, it's not that they did anything wrong, it's just as the company grew, they weren't as relevant. And make, it, make a situation in which is okay for both sides that if they aren't gonna stay as an advisor, you can ask them that. That probably involves vesting and a level of communication. But I, I think you all will benefit so much by having all these things clearly understood up front. All right, let's, oh, can I get a quick time check? Anyone? 11-11. What? 11-11, perfect. <laughs> okay, legal structure. Um, people make a big deal out of this. I've had, I was the, initiator of God knows how many conversations of LLC, C Corp, S Corp, Blech. is my answer. It matters, it definitely matters. Being an LLC with path, pass through losses and profits matters. Um, but ultimately people spend too much time stressing about it, in my opinion. Side note, it's an important one. LLCs can be nice because the losses, if you are not making a profit pass through, um, as I learned from personal experience, just to be very direct, if you ever want to say apply for a loan for a car or a home and your tax return has been negative for the last couple years, you're kind of up the, up the creek without a paddle. Just keep that in mind. There are downsides to the losses passing through to you, which nobody ever told me and I never would have thought through. Um, but get the right insight and feedback from possible investors, your sector, whoever it is that you think will have the most vested understanding in why your corporate structure matters. Um, a lot of people, I don't, from what I heard about the companies y'all are making, I think this is less relevant. There's all these newfangled L3Cs and different social enterprise structures. Have any, who have you heard of that even? Oh cool, I don't even have to worry about that. Don't make it complicated, make it simple. Don't create extra subsidiaries. In our case, because we're a hybrid nonprofit, uh, or sorry, hybrid social enterprise, I use that term loosely, in, a, in that Runa has a for-profit and then there's a non-profit partner, which has really enabled us to do what we wanna do. That's great, and it really critically made a clear difference in our ability to accomplish our mission. But do it for that reason, not just because you think it's nice. Um, I'm not personally the biggest fan of one-for-one -one models. There's some companies like Warby Parker that I really respect but you also notice you don't really even see their one-for-one -one model. How many of you know what a one-for-one -one is? Okay, for those of you who don't, it's a business where you buy something and they contribute something to another community that would benefit from that. It's generally marketing. I relatively discourage that. If you wanna do that, ultimately, great. I, if you're looking to create a business model with social good or benefit to livelihoods and communities, I'd much rather see a business model where the actual core part of doing business makes that difference. If it's baked into what you're doing, that means just by the basic course of doing your business, like with Runa, you can actually drive benefits to communities. I'd much rather see that in general, although I've seen good examples otherwise. Um, last thing on the corporate structure front, generally the best thing to do is to incorporate in Delaware or one of those other states. We're incorporated in Rhode Island, our investors don't get it. Uh, we have to file all these forms. It seemed nice at the time. I lived over by Prospect Park. I could walk down to the Secretary of State's office. 
suck it up, pay the $200, get a registered agent in Delaware. I promise you, it'll make your life a lot easier. Um, I will reiterate this in a second, but have thought and caution with your legal fees. Make sure you get a clear communication from your lawyer. Make sure you're understanding what time is being taken. Phone calls take up time. Emails take up time. More, more times than I count, <clears throat> excuse me, I've seen people go and ask their lawyer a bunch of legal questions they could have asked by looking at it on the internet, and that cost them $800. Your lawyer will gladly get on the phone with you, but use their time very sparingly, keep a clear accounting of it, and be very careful you use the right lawyers for the right things. Um, okay. So you've got your structure, you're gonna launch a product. I'm a, I could go on about this for hours, and I'll save this for questions later, but I will tell you a quick anecdote, and there's a core lesson I'll share through this. When you launch a product or service, it's inevitably going to evolve. evolve. It's harder to evolve a physical product that's in a box than it is a website or a software service. So this may apply differently to different ones of you. Um, but put your best foot forward, and <coughs> Have a clear timeline for the development and the launch of that product. Have a clear timeline. I'm serious. Have a clear plan. Just to give the brief example, at Runa, we always knew that these liquid products, we always knew that the liquid products were going to be our big seller. We saw the size of the market. We knew that was the greatest opportunity. But like I said, it cost, I, wasn't, I exaggerated, it probably wasn't six figures, but it was more money than we wanted to spend because of the minimums and so forth to launch it. And no one had ever made a product with Guayusa before. So we ended up launching with bag tea, which was great. We got in the market first, we got it out there. We were still building up capacity in Ecuador. Again, there's a lot of stuff I've glossed over about how we actually built this in Ecuador. I can talk about it if you're curious. But suffice it to say, because we built the world's first value chain for Guayusa, commercial value chain, um, we, we were kind of going, I call it a stepwise kind of catch-22 process. So we ultimately launched the bag teas first. We thought, okay, this is great, it's hot. By the way, side note, trying to sell hot tea in the summer is some of the, one of the least fun things I've ever done in my life. Just like walking with a backpack and I had this iced tea dispensers in the streets of New York, sweating, sweat dripping down my face, walking into a cafe, and you just see these store owners look at me like, are you the craziest person alive? I do not want to buy hot tea from you. I'm like, no, no, no. We'll, we'll give you this iced tea dispenser. And he's looking at me like, you are actually crazy. Please get out of my store. That aside, we did end up more fully launching it in the fall. But one thing we learned is a few, well, we learned a couple things. One, though, whatever you launch first, you will be held accountable for that, especially if it's a physical product which is harder to evolve. So don't go crazy. Like I said, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, but you will be held accountable for whatever first hits shelves. So get your branding relatively right. Get your flavors relatively right. Get your ingredients relatively right. If it's a service, get the components, get the offerings. Have a pricing model that you know you're not gonna have to raise too much later. Whatever it is, the first impression you make is, for better or worse, the one that people are often gonna stick with you. Um, and also importantly, go after the biggest opportunity. As it turned out, brief anecdote, you know, we were working with this pretty well-respected uh, formulator who ultimately made products we were happy with, but she'd been working for like a year, and we assumed she was, maybe not a year, maybe six months, I don't remember exactly. She was off to the races doing it on her own at her lab in California, and we finally got to meet with her at her lab, and we sit down and we hadn't been super stoked about the samples she'd sent. And we sit down and we realized that she had a bag of like guayusa that we hadn't even really made, that she was using to formulate this. It's like something we bought from a community when we had our first dryer. And I forget the, I forget the exact story, but it like definitely wasn't our best stuff. We'd already spent six months formulating this. We probably could have launched the ready to drink beverages a year earlier had we really had that clear measurable timeline for ourselves and a clear way of communicating with her. And going back, honestly, like thinking on it now, I would have rather raised the money and waited to launch the beverages first um, and maybe never not launch the hot tea till later. 
It's a longer complication about the fact that the, tea, the Runa tea bags have less caffeine than the bottles. We want to keep to a strong and clear brand proposition. But I think you guys get the picture there. OK. Um, so again, I can talk more about product launches and picking your initial products. But again, for the interest of time, let's move on to branding. Um, so this logo you see here, I love doing that. This logo you see here is probably our fourth logo that we've ever come up with. Um, one of those was the one we had our co-founder Charlie's brother make that we put in our business plan. But when we first launched the product, and this would be the one slide I wish I had. Go look it up. If you scroll down, like go to Google, go to Images, look up Runa. If you scroll down, 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 you'll see these tea boxes that are, I'm actually really thirsty. Ah, refreshing. Um, you'll scroll down and you'll see we have this beige, very soft, fair trade looking tea box with really kind of gentle indigenous logos or indigenous inspired logos, which it was beautiful. But it wasn't actually the brand we were going for. In our head, when we launched, we had this preconception that we wanted to be a fair trade tea brand and really lean forward with the fact that we worked with indigenous communities, which we've gone back and forth on how much we need to include that in our branding. And it's actually leaned more into our branding over the time. But Runa and Guayusa are functional products. And that branding didn't reflect our functionality, just like the hot tea didn't. So within a year and a half, when we launched the bottles, we actually rebranded. Um, branding is kind of like, how many of you have seen Spinal Tap? God, I'm dating myself here. It's like, this, it's like our Spinal Tap drummer. Again, look at that reference. The short answer is the movie Spinal Tap. They constantly were revolving drummers. It was like, it's the thing that we constantly felt like we were figuring out. And honestly, and Tyler, I'm sure, would echo this, we, we really feel with this that we only finally got to a point of something that really represents the foot we want to put forward. So with branding, you know, I'm, I'm basically just like giving an alley up to Danny's talk here, but a couple critical things. Really understand what are you trying to communicate and to whom. Who's not just your early adopter audience, but where do you see the brand going in a year? What's your aspirational audience? Not just what's going to get the first buyers to take it off the shelf, but, and this is critical, what's going to keep people coming back to your website or your product or your service? How do they most want to see information? It's really easy. You'll see there's not actually a ton of words on this. It's really easy, especially for those of us who have a predilection towards words, big words like predilection, it's really easy to jam a bunch of words on there and want to tell your whole story because you're so excited. Of course you are. We all believe in what we're doing. But words often aren't the best way to get people's attention. Be it a website or a marketing email or a product on a shelf, you have anywhere from 2 to 30 seconds of someone's attention. 30 is really lucky. How do you make that attention count? We, as a society, are living in an era of an attention crisis, I would almost say. We have so much information coming at us, so many products and services and websites coming at us. It's really hard to sort information. I know one of y'all I heard is working on a fake news related thing. That's great. Because we get too much information, it's hard to separate the wheat from the chaff these days. Um, but in terms of figuring out your brand, make sure you, again, what are you communicating? How are you communicating it? Who are you communicating it to? In terms of some of the nuts and bolts, um, hiring a good branding or design resource is critical. You want to go through, I think, the whole analysis of your brand proposition, the story, the communication guidelines, the, the, the really sort of basic stuff, the motifs, et cetera. You don't need to hire a fancy firm to spend a ton of money on it. Maybe you do, depending on what you're creating. But sometimes really good freelancers can do the job well. I don't have the answer for you all, but finding that critical balance between what is really good quality, thoughtful, keyword, strategic work versus what's not going to break your bank and finding the sort of happy medium between those is my strongest encouragement for going about your branding process. Um, and I'll reiterate this, and I said this before, but we numerous times did equity for services deals. Um, a little anecdote, you know, we did that with our branding firm, our first one, and our second one. I'm not sure about our third one. Um, but your equity is worth something to you. 
Oftentimes branding firms, they will treat you as a second tier client because they're actually bringing in less cash. Just because you think your equity is worth a lot, because it is to you, it's not liquid for the people you grant it to as services. And it may be worth spending that cash to get higher in their priority list if you have a timeline. But also, and this is a critical thing, really read the contract. Our first branding firm that did our, uh, the bottles, they had in the contract that they would also do our tea boxes and our website. So we did the bottles. They worked well for us. We launched with them. I'm really glad at where the logo has evolved to and the brand motif has evolved to, but it was good stuff generally. But then it came time to design the boxes and we had a designer we worked with who was a, you know, a great guy who implemented stuff. He would have cost, I think, $6,000 to design all the tea boxes. For the same job, much bigger and unnecessary process, the branding firm we worked with wanted something like $80,000, which as a side note was like what we made in half a year on the tea boxes. I see that look there, yeah. So they owned the copyright. We ended up having to buy out the copyright because frankly we didn't, it's not that we didn't read the contract, but we didn't really understand what that meant and that came back to get us. It all worked out fine, everyone's relatively happy, but we learned a lot from that. Okay, um, let me see how much more. Wow, I have a fair bit of, oh no, we're good, okay. All right, so you got your product designs, you know what you're going out there with to the market, now you gotta raise some money. Let's talk about that. Bootstrapping, it's great, it is often really critical, don't raise money sooner than you have to. At the same time, we didn't. We raised, frankly, probably more money than we should have. Uh, it's nice to learn on other people's dime. Uh, it all worked out fine, but there's a, a fine line between keeping yourself a little cash hungry to make sure that you have the motivation to not spend money unnecessarily and giving yourself enough capital that you're not out fundraising or eat, don't eat ramen. I know that Adage, don't eat ramen. It's, it's great sometimes, but eating, eating a cup of noodles for 10 years is gonna probably give you a lot of health problems you don't need. So what's that fine line where you can support yourself and your business without raising unnecessary cash? I know a lot of entrepreneurs who've held themselves back from big growth opportunities because they were religiously, religiously sticking to bootstrapping. Um, but at the same time, when you have to raise money, you have to raise money. Um, the biggest thing I'd say is raise what you need, not what you want. Raise enough under that need premise to get you through 12 to 18 months. I spent a huge chunk of our first three years raising money. Y'all will laugh. We were raising like $5,000 at a time from friends and family. Um, and we needed that. And that was what we got in. But we also, we also spent a lot of time doing that when we could have been more focused on growth. Um, so trying to raise the chunk of money that will get you to where you're trying to go without constantly being raising is great. Don't be precious about your valuation. I'll talk about valuation in a second. Um, be, be thoughtful about what your company's really worth to you, but also the market standards. For those of you starting food or beverage companies, whatever you do, don't use uh, vitamin water or buy as valuation examples. You'll get laughed out of the room. So yes, you can, you can cite the, the high valuation of exits recently. That won't get you very far. But, and this, this is something I really learned, understanding what the underlying drivers of valuation in your industry are is really critical. Great example, there was a bunch of debate within the company I had with other entrepreneurs about the multiple of sales being based on gross or net sales. Guess what, our margins weren't amazing for a couple of years that difference could have made a huge change in our valuation. And we wanted it to be gross. It ultimately ended up being net. It all worked out fine, but that's really critical. So knowing the factors, knowing that your trade spending, in our example, went out of that, whatever factors drive your valuation, is it your revenue, is it earnings, are you in an industry where cash flow positivity makes a difference? Knowing what that is and factoring that in and talking to people who know your industry to get that information is critical. Um, Relatedly, don't fall into what I call the valuation trap. If you set a high valuation because you really wanna set, set something to not dilute yourself too much, that's critical. Don't over dilute yourself in the first round, but if you lock yourself into a high valuation, and then you have to get your numbers up to meet that valuation, 
and then you're raising money to support the sales that meet that valuation, and then all of a sudden you're overvalued. That's a valuation trap, and I've seen it many, many times. And really thinking through that balance, uh, you'll see this is a theme, balance. I could pretty much walk out of the room now and just say balance things. Um, but that, that intersection between what makes sure you don't overly dilute yourself and what, um, what actually creates opportunity to grow into a valuation is critical. Um, Dun, 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 dun. Um, I'll give an example even. I have a friend recently who, she's starting a tech company. I think it'll be successful. I'm actually super curious to see how this goes. She's doing a convertible debt round where she's got one valuation now and she wants to do a different one in six months when her tech is set up. That may work. I'm curious to see her try it. But really pushing on that valuation front to preserve as much equity as possible can create challenges. As a side note though, Convertible debt is awesome. I see most entrepreneurs do it when they start out. Who here knows what convertible debt is? Most of you do. For those of you who don't, it's, it's equity-like debt where it is technically debt. You're not under obligation to pay the cash back. It will convert to equity, hence the convertible part. And you set a valuation cap so your investors don't know that you're going to go crazy and decide one day that you said 10 million, your company's worth 100 million, so they know relatively what their money's worth. But it allows you to avoid forcing yourself into a number when you actually don't know for sure 110% what your product's going to be or your revenue model and so forth. So I highly encourage convertible debt. I also highly, highly encourage you to create option pools early on to make sure that you don't have to go back and change your bylaws or do another offering to create equity for your employees. As a general rule, the fewer times you have to go to your board for approval of things within very clear reasons and limit, reasonable limits, the better off you are. So whatever you can think ahead on in terms of your legal structure, your board, your equity, the more you can think ahead on that, the less BS wrangling you'll have to do with paperwork later. Um, so related to finances is um, bookkeeping. As just a side note, get a bookkeeper. Unless you know bookkeeping already, get someone at the very least to help you set it up properly and someone who knows your industry. For example, in food and beverage, there's so much intricacy to the way you produce things, the ingredients costs, etc. I know that it can be expensive, but finding someone to set your books up so you don't have to go back and fix them later or go through an audit. You have to do an audit no matter what because that's what investors expect. Setting yourself up to have your financial systems structured as closely as possible to the way you actually do business will save you many, many headaches. And find a good bookkeeper. Find someone initially who can take care of your accounts payable and if you're making money, your accounts receivable. And setting yourself up not to be too deep in the financial weeds more than you have to is great. Now, if you get your bookkeeper to set it up and it's relatively straightforward and that's just work you do on your computer while you're chilling at home, great. Or in the office. I just like doing it on my couch personally. Whatever it is, that's great. Okay, so now you have money and you want to spend it. First advice, don't. Seriously, don't. Okay, but seriously, it's really easy, and this is why I said raise what you need, not what you want, to get yourself into a trap of, okay, we have money, let's go out and spend it, and spend more to make more. It's really critical to invest in the things that are important and you know will drive growth, but don't spend what you don't have. Don't get into that valuation trap. I'm gonna get concrete here and tell you a couple of the things that I think are easily overspent, but first and foremost, take the time and review your budgets. Review your credit card statements. For those of you starting food and beverage companies, review the chargeback reports you get from distributors. I'll go into that in a sec. Um, but go over it with a fine tooth comb. Get into that habit. That level, don't, I don't encourage micromanagement as a general rule, but on finances, every dollar counts. Um, and set policies. You know, if you have employees, set travel policies, set spending policies. Your startup, so you can get away with more. But have it in writing and create as little confusion as possible without being overly rigid about it, to make sure that you know what is being spent where and you know how to track it and you know how to categorize it. So, I'm gonna have to pull this up to, to go into more detail. Um, travel. 
don't always take the Chinatown bus. You've probably heard about examples on I-95. Discourage that. But don't book your tickets a week out. I know that's straightforward, but I had to learn that the hard way. You will pay three times as much on an airplane ticket if you book it the day before because you might take that last minute meeting. Um, use Airbnb. It's often cheaper than hotels. I heard the Airbnb co-founder came in the other day, so you probably all got a discount code, right? <laughs> um, do, I highly encourage this as someone who just is a little obsessed with this, get a credit card that accrues you miles. Don't just use your debit card. Even for the business, you can get one of those. Um, you often, as a side note, if you use the credit card for the airline, you get double the miles on that trip. Those can add up. All of a sudden, you're saving $500 on that investor trip to California. Um, and as a general rule on travel, again, keyword here, balance. I personally hate red eyes. Uh, sometimes you want to go for the cheapest thing. Tyler loved red eyes because it, it gave him that much more time to work. I turned into a zombie the next day. Um, but whatever it is, you know, don't take yourself on the three-stop round-trip ticket through Minneapolis and Houston and Denver. Sometimes it's worth spending a little more to make your life sane. Um, okay, other categories. Marketing. Keep track of money you're spending on search engine marketing and Facebook ads. If you don't set a limit, if you're not watching that, you can end up with a $10,000 bill. Um, for my industry, a couple things that I really had to keep track of Promotional items, swag, things that you think you need, you often don't. There's a lot of campaigns people will tell you, oh, you should do street posters because it's cool and all the cool kids are doing it. Again, dating myself. You can easily blow a lot of money on marketing if you're not careful. Of all the categories I'm talking about, the things I would particularly say look at twice and think about before you spend money, marketing falls into that. Um, again, for those of you in product businesses, sort of in-person and event marketing and sponsorships, and sponsorships applies across the board. Think twice, think three times, think four times. Think clear, and this is something I'd really say actually, this is the strongest advice I'd give. What is the direct pathway between the exposure you're getting to the value it creates for your business? Great example, uh, we sponsored a concert series in Brooklyn, and I love this concert series, I still go, I'm still friends. It ended up being like, the, the end of the story is it was like kind of not a great deal, but it wasn't a horrible deal, which is why I feel great telling you about it. But we were sponsoring this concert in Prospect Park. But we didn't have distribution, really, in Brooklyn. We were in Whole Foods, we were in a couple stores. But again, this is more of a product business focus. I want to, if I'm going to spend money now on any sort of promotion or marketing, I want to walk out of the event, the next time I walk into a store, I want to say, oh, Runa, I tried that, that's great, I'm gonna buy some. People don't go looking for you because they see you. That's just not how consumers work. It's easier online, I'll talk about online sales briefly, but make sure you have a clear pathway from exposure to interaction to value for your brands. Um, okay, sales, or last thing on marketing relates to sales. Particularly, I'm sorry for those of you not working in food and beverage, but, or at least durable goods. If you're working with retailers, they're going to tell you things you need to do. You often don't. Uh, the biggest distributor in my industry is right here in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and they have all sorts of fun ad programs that nobody reads, but it's really just the price of doing business. If you know that, it's just a fee. You're paying a fee. You can try to negotiate them into other programs that you think will make a bigger difference for your business, which we successfully did. Um, but other times, stores will tell you, oh man, like, I'm gonna put you in the cold shelf, like you got something for me, can you give me a free deal, can you give me a t-shirt? You gotta play the game sometimes, but you gotta be careful too. Just like you are always looking for a bargain, other people are always looking for a deal. They're held accountable for that. Um, so when it comes to fees, brokers, discounts, promotions, think twice, think three times. Do I need this? Is this a price of doing business? Will it make a difference in my business? Um, Staff, briefly, again, lesson here, it's balance. What do you need to really take things off your plate? And I'll talk a little more about specific hires. Take critical things off your plate and put them in the hands of someone who's qualified and capable versus where are you trying to fill the gaps? Um, briefly with sales, that's something I'll just say in general in a sec, but you wanna be focused and you want people who can support that focus, but you don't wanna be 
expanding to California because there's an opportunity there when really you need to be focused on actually getting repeat sales and driving attention and showing that your business has legs. Okay, so on that note, you've got a product, you're getting it out there. How do you drive your sales? Um, one, track your sales. Get a CRM. Bluntly, personally, I dislike using Salesforce. Thankfully, there are, let's see that, yeah, it's, the, it's like MS-DOS. Um, but there, there are other options out there. Even if it's a spreadsheet, track the accounts you're in, track your relationships, do it early. For I work part-time at a venture capital fund now, I'm even going back and going through all my contacts I didn't track, and I'm like, why didn't I just do this as I was going along? I'm still learning this lesson. Track your relationships. Key, key thing, and I could talk for 20 minutes, I won't now, about how I've optimized Gmail to be most useful to me. Uh, briefly, I'd say, use Boomerang, it's a great tool, look it up. Set up multiple inboxes, set up filters, that's my advice. But keep a list of contacts, be it brokers, be it people that you want to send out hiring posts to. The more you organize that upfront, the less it becomes a distraction later when you're looking to get the word out. But track that information. Um, side note, online sales. Brick and mortar stores, tougher and tougher to work with. The more product brands I talk to, especially that don't have a pound per unit or whatever this weighs, weight, online sales is more and more the way to go. I'm gonna sidebar that, that's a whole half hour conversation, as is the nuts and bolts of brick and mortar food and beverage industry stuff. But the key lesson here is, whatever the best venue to reach your ideal target customer, to promote your product, and to minimize your operational burden, that's the general rubric I use when I'm looking at distribution and sales channels. Um, and to reiterate something I said before, go deep, not wide. When I talked at the beginning about there's plenty of advice that I was given and didn't listen to, this is the number one thing. We're so special, our product's amazing, you don't get it, we're gonna go to California and it's gonna sell like hotcakes. California actually is one of our best markets now. But bluntly, and I've said this publicly before, I wish we had spread ourselves a little less thin by focusing more on really getting traction and repeat sales in our near home market, which was New York. There's other markets we focused on and invested in a lot, but when I look back on it, I'm like, you know, demographically, culturally, good markets for us in some form in the long term, not the best fit up front. I talked about the valuation trap before. You want to be really clear that you are getting, you are catching on with consumers. So going deep in a, uh, in a market is really critical to actually building that momentum, seeing what brings people back, and actually building that brand story. Did I get a time check? Great. Oh, I'm almost done. Perfect. Um, I could talk about operations for hours. Uh, again, it's, my knowledge is very specific here, but critically, get it as right as you can. Making mistakes on what you're spending on, on your systems, on the way that you go about doing business, it can cost you a lot more later. Um, you know, getting your logistics right, getting your bookkeeping right, getting your digital systems right, getting your backend systems right, you're not gonna get them perfect, but one of the biggest things I learned is by going for the cheaper thing, we often had to do three times as much work later to get ourselves out of it, and we spent more money fixing situations. For example, briefly, we set up Salesforce with one login and then multiple systems underneath that when Salesforce is built to have multiple logins. I don't know how Runa still does it, but that ended up causing us more and more work the more we got into that system later. Um, customer service is a really critical one if you have any sort of service or product where customers interact with. I literally had my cell phone connected to our customer service line. I get woken up at three in the morning by someone in California who wish they'd ordered a different flavor. Uh, maybe you don't need customer service on all the time. But particularly if you're working with wholesalers or other big clients, having, a, having someone who really can handle customer service interact with your operational side and interact with your sales side, and it's probably not you in the long term or even the medium term as the founder or co-founder of your company, setting that up up front and having a clear process and having someone who really can just be on the ball and deal with it, and side note, is cool with dealing with it. 
Some people come in and they say they're willing to do anything, but it turns out they're not at all excited about the nitty gritty of the day to day of whatever your industry is. Test that. Make sure that you have the right people who are really willing to do that, at least for the medium term. Um, and that gets us to hiring. Um, we did something great. We hired a lot of young, not young, young is the not correct term, early in their career, ambitious, hungry people, which I highly encourage in general in specific or clear roles. Often people who have been in corporate spaces for a while in their career have trouble adapting to startups. Pe young, there are people early in their career can learn quickly, they can pick up stuff, uh, they can pick up knowledge, they can pick up relationships, but the flip side is, Sometimes it is worth paying for those things. Like I said, operations, someone who really knew how to handle our logistics. We saved more money by hiring someone who we didn't think we could afford than we were spending on mistakes. Um, salespeople, no matter what industry you're in, be it a software as a service business, working with institutional clients or a product business, relationships take time to build. And sometimes spending that extra 20 or 30 grand or extra equity to get a person with those relationships is critical, but like I said with advisors, no matter who it is, setting yourself up for a trial period, a way of getting to work with someone and know them, um, really doing your diligence on interviewing, and we can sidebar it, but I have all sorts of thoughts on good interview practices. It's really critical to getting the right people in because you can build relationships and get excited with someone who two months later turns out isn't a good fit. Mm -hmm. And there's many reasons why you might not be able to tell that from an interview or references. Um, and to that note, making sure that it's really clear whatever that process is and how you're going to get to know and work with each other saves a lot of pain later. Likewise, as a side note, I don't love talking about titles, but we made a lot of, a lot of not the best decisions on the titles we gave people. Go look in your industry. Thru throughout any of these points, talking to other people in your industry about, you know, should someone doing this early in their career with room to grow, should they be a director or a manager? Uh, COO ended up meaning something very different than I thought it did. So especially for people early in their career, a title really matters. And make sure that it aligns with what is standard. Similarly, pay. There's lots of legal and ethical practices around pay and what you can ask or not. But as a brief sidebar, I would say, if you get someone at pay below what they're probably comfortable with, inevitably they're gonna to need to ask for a raise because they weren't comfortable with it, and you're probably gonna get what you paid for. So that's my thoughts on that. Um, oh, last on hiring. Places where I think it's really worth spending more money than you might want to, like I said, a good bookkeeper or financial management, and sometimes that's like an outside part-time controller. I have a great one based in Rhode Island, if any of you are looking. Um, an ops person who can really manage the day-to-day -day logistics and operations and systems. Like I said, salespeople with real relationships. And the last one is consultants. Oftentimes consultants are more expensive and not worth it and don't deliver. Everything I said about advisors can apply to consultants as well. But sometimes you wanna bring in a ninja who can just set something up, get it set up, and do the hard work to do something complicated and build it out. Okay, so we've raised money, we're starting to sell products, we're running to the races. Where now? What's next for us as co-founders? So what I want to talk briefly about personal priorities. Startups are hard, team. They are not easy. It's never as easy. No matter how hard you think it'll be, it's always going to be a little harder. There's always going to be a crisis of some sort. If any of you end up making it through a startup without a major crisis, I'll give you my email, call me up in five years, I'm going to buy you a great dinner because you are a hero. Um, you're a hero anyways, but you're going to work hard and you must, must, must take care of yourself. I want to repeat that for emphasis. Take care of yourself. Get some sleep. Eat some food. Eat healthy food. Create personal practices. I meditate. I write every morning. Oh, I don't do it every morning. I'm not going to pretend I'm perfect. I try to do it every morning. I try to work out most days of the week. I did that throughout Runa. I took weekends off more than once every six months. Whatever it takes to take care of yourself, do it. Maintain friendships. 
being in a startup is hard and having, keeping community really matters to me personally. But whatever it is for you to take care of yourself, create those practices and create the personal accountability priorities. Check in with yourself, check in with your partners, check in with your, with your priorities every month or so to make sure that you are aligned with your greater purpose. There's a whole, there's a whole article I read recently, I forget the author, where saying time is the new money. A mark of privilege, I haven't even addressed privilege yet, I may have to get into that briefly, but a mark of privilege is saying that you don't have enough time. You have time. Prioritize the people you care about and yourself. And saying you're too busy is, an, is not a good excuse. You must, must, must take time to think creatively and strategically. Go get a whiteboard. Map out your priorities for the month. Map out your personal goals. Map out things that are fun for you. Sometimes you will be working crazy weeks on end without time to sleep, and that happens. I'm not saying that won't. But whatever it is, make sure that you are doing what it takes to take care of yourself and your priorities. Um, you know, some of the categories of things that entrepreneurs fail to pay attention to at times is, uh, let's see, what's my fun list here? Uh, friends, sleep, exercise, these things called hobbies, intimacy, family. I know I'm, I'm droning on here because it's important. Um, and really, ultimately, and I'm going to wind this down here, but this is about growth. Probably half of you, your startups will fail in some form, and failure is great, and failure isn't a stretch here. It may evolve, it may pivot. Whatever happens, not all startups succeed. So how do you grow out of this process? How do you create procedures, tracking, growth, themes, whatever it is that you have an opportunity to learn from your experience and create the practices that allow you to continue to evolve over the course of doing this. Have monthly practices and rituals. Take time for thinking and planning. Take time to look at the big picture, like I said earlier, and see if you are in alignment with your purpose and why you started this originally. Because sooner or later, you're going to leave. You may sell the company, or you may do what I did, which is after seven years, I took a step back and I looked and I saw that what I was doing day to day wasn't actually in deep alignment with why I started this company. I started Runa because of what we do with the communities we work with. And that's why I'm still super proud to be on the board of and deeply involved with Runa Foundation, which I can talk more about. But I realized, and literally I woke up one day after a tough conversation with my girlfriend at the time, and I realized that I wasn't actually doing the thing I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And it came at a moment where it was kind of, pardon my French, but it was, well, yeah, I'll just say it. It was the shit or get off the pot moment. It was either stick it out for another five years until what I hope will be, that's coming up on three years, uh, three years from now, would be the exit, or move into the next phase of my life. Which, can I tell you all, was one of the scariest things I've done in my life. It was almost as scary as, actually starting Runa didn't feel that scary, I'm not gonna make that up. But it was one of the scariest decisions of my life. And I, I wouldn't take it back for a second. I love the company. I'm so, so proud of what we created. I wouldn't trade a day of it. I became a man, I became who I am because of that process. But I saw the writing on the wall and I recognized that it was time to take that next leap. And so you'll know whenever that is for you. You, it may turn out that the company that you are creating is exactly what you want to spend your life doing, and you'll go on doing that. It also may turn out that in three years, you're not the right one for this. Maybe you're better off doing the marketing. What, you'll see plenty of examples of startups where the founder is no longer the CEO. Whatever it is, be willing to have a clear conversation with yourself, your team, and your investors, and keep yourself accountable to that. Because ultimately, this is about your passion and what you want to create. And you should be creating something that inspires and excites you every day. Not every day, that's not gonna happen. But day to day in general. And that's the best thing you can ask for. And that's what I got. So um, we, you know, y'all are getting lunch now and I went on longer than I expected, but I baked this in. So, we, I think we set this up, we we're gonna do it kind of as a working lunch and we can all grab food and I can keep answering questions and so on. Yeah. Well, we need, to, we need to, we'll set up
Yeah, so you can keep going. Oh, great. Cool. Perfect. Is that the idea? Yeah. yeah. All right. So who's got questions? Uh, yes, you in the back. Yeah, could you talk about the, the biggest crisis during your process and how did you work it, work it out? Starting off easy. Oh, man. Ah, there is no one biggest crisis. Um, let me think of, instead I'm going to answer your question by saying what is the most illustrative one? What do I think has the most lessons? Um, okay, I got it. So believe it or not, picking the bottle that we were going to use for our product ended up being a really critical, mildly contentious decision. There's one bottle you'll see that Snapple or Honest Tea or other major tea brands is in. It's like literally called the Snapple bottle. It's a 16 ounce bottle. Um, and that one's readily available. And then we had the other bottle, which our product is in, and more and more people have used since we launched Runa. And right before we were gonna go into production of our first run, the glass company ran out of them. Yeah, so we went, I must have called up 10 different brands, trying to buy their extra products. And I was really pushing to bail. I was like, let's just redesign. We haven't printed the labels yet. Let's just redesign it. And it was, it was like a confluence of all the factors. It was the way that I interacted with my partner. It was the way, it was what we were gonna launch with, what were the critical aspects of the product and its branding that mattered to us. And ultimately, we went through a really deep process of like half a day figuring this out. We mapped out the costs, we mapped out the timelines, we mapped out our expectations. We ended up going with that bottle and it ended up just barely working out and gave me some heartburn. It was kind of risky. But what I'd say is we, we did it, ultimately it started off as a, it started off as a crisis and we turned it into an opportunity to really deliberate on what mattered to us most in our product and in the, the various branding decisions we made. So that's one. Um, I will tell another about working in Ecuador because you know, for very few of you I think are working directly in foreign countries so I lean more on the US side but there's a whole wealth of stories I can tell about what we did in Ecuador. Um, and originally we set up in two different provinces. And just as I said, companies can easily get ahead of their skis by expanding their distribution too much. We also probably overspanded on our operations. And it kind of reached a critical point. We, our payroll was too high, and the leadership in one of the provinces wasn't really actually independently operating and measuring up. And so we ultimately, we had a lot of debate about it because we were really attached to having multiple spaces, a little um, mitigation of supply chain risks. And we ultimately, decided to shut one down and we actually had to go and we had to go do it really quickly because we knew it was going to be frustrating and cause drama and it's tough to do stuff like that in Ecuador and it was hard. We hurt people. I don't like hurting people's feelings. Uh, nobody likes it. I've gotten, I've come to recognize that sometimes it happens through the course of doing the things you have to do but through that decision we had to really early on learn the lesson of being willing to let go of our preconceptions about how we thought we were supposed to do business in order to actually build a business that could survive. So those are the two that come to mind. Hi, um, I'm curious about your relationship with the indigenous communities that you work with um, and how that relationship evolved with the development of Luna, mm -hmm. um, particularly, particularly your own role in working with them, because I believe you mentioned that was a reason for your shift in, in what you're doing. Yeah, um, well so to answer, I'll answer that last question first. I was in Ecuador for the first year with Tyler and ultimately our rules became clear that one of us needed to go back to the US and manage the business here. I was actually living on Governor Street in Providence for a year and a half doing that. Um, so there was still the first couple years when it was the building phase. I think I, mi I even, mi thank you for pointing that out, this reflection. I loved the sort of the energy of building the company and creating it and creating a beverage company. So it wasn't so much working on a physical product or the beverage company, it was when we got into the operational phase, like deep operational phase, seven years in, not like operating two years in, where it was clear that I needed to focus 
90% of my time on sales and working in the grocery industry. And that's what didn't excite me anymore. But I wasn't, I was still very involved in the strategy, working with the communities throughout, and that excited me. Um, but just to make clear that I wasn't working day to day in Ecuador like Tyler was later on. But to answer your first question, so the best way to share that is a couple things. One, and I, I thank you, this reminds me of a key point. One of my most critical skills and abilities in life, I think, is listening. For me personally as an entrepreneur, I think for most successful humans, as I said, empathy, openness, and the willingness to listen. Um, so when we first moved to Ecuador, we, we spent like three months, we were going out and pitching our idea to communities. It was also like, what are your lives like? What matters to you? What is hard for you? What do you love? Why do you care about this? What would make this work for you? So we got a lot of feedback up front, but we also had preconceptions. I talked a little bit about our hybrid model. We, for various reasons, felt when we started the company that we had to operate on the ground as a nonprofit. Ultimately, farmers were like, I don't, I don't care. In fact, I see too many nonprofits. I don't, we don't need to start another community association. So we kind of set the nonprofit aside. We also were very much about fair trade and cooperate, cooperatives, which I think are generally great. But these communities already worked with chocolate and coffee, and those prices are highly variable, so that's a different issue. But there's a lot of indigenous committees and organizations and cooperatives, and ultimately the farmers are like, yo, I'm already part of it. They didn't say yo, but, <laughs> well, not in English, in Spanish they did, but. Um, I'm already part of like two other cooperatives. I already have plenty of politics to deal with. Like I just, like for this to really be something for me, like make it easy. So we actually went to fair trade and said, hey, sorry, we know that you only want to work with businesses that source from cooperatives and we get that. The communities don't actually want this. So sorry, we're not going to do fair trade right now. And it wasn't us going in and being like, do it our way. But they were like, oh, okay. And they came back to us, I don't know, a few months later and said, listen, we hear you. You're not the only business with this issue. We actually want to work with you to create, this is Fair Trade USA, Fair Trade International. They split, there's a whole, there's a whole thing behind that. But Fair Trade USA said, we believe that for our community and our standard to grow, we want to make it possible for businesses like yours. So we actually were able to get Fair Trade certified with that system. Um, you know, other things just, I, I gotta drop categories because this could be an hour long lecture, but we ultimately evolved from planting and working directly with the communities to planting Guayusa to recognizing that we needed to focus on actually harvesting and maintaining and working with the plants, which really changed our relations. Um, at this point, one of the things I'm most excited about is we're actually through the foundation, the Runa Foundation is working to build a factory with a community that's actually gonna own it and bring more of that value chain into the communities, which was always a dream, probably took longer to realize than I would have imagined at first, but that's the kind of evolution that really excites me. Yeah. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Um, okay, who else? When you went for your first round of funding, where were, did, what did your product look like? Did you have a product? Um, were, there, were there any marketing components? Like, what, what did your company look like by the time that you went for your first round of funding? We started raising money from day one. Because we, unlike a lot of companies, we had to build a, we had to build a value chain from day one and that cost money. Um, so we raised a significant amount of convertible debt from friends, family, fools, as the term goes. And so we, uh, yeah, we, we, we raised a significant amount of money before we ever had any serious revenue, which is different than a lot of other companies, but a lot of tea companies, they can go buy their product from a, a vendor or a wholesaler and get off to the races. Um, but uh, iterating the question a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so, so I guess beyond, beyond the, the first like friends, family, fools, when you actually went for some investment capital from, or did, or did you have a round of investment capital? So we had a convertible debt round that lasted three years. Wow. Yeah, um, we got away with a lot that probably people couldn't get away with this year, th this, this day and age. Um, so 
we ultimately didn't raise a Series A. There was, again, there was no seed or pre-seed. <laughs> Back in the good old days of 2009, those weren't terms that really existed. So we didn't actually raise a round of capital in which our first three years of capital converted into until 2012. Side note, um, the food is here and it smells great, so I will gladly keep talking, but don't be shy. Go ahead and grab food. Well, what, what I was going to suggest oh. in, in that regard is that what, what we've done in the past is let people grab food and then uh, you just kind of mingle and you can cool. eat and uh, okay. people can come and gather in front of you and, and uh, for, not in front of you, but with you. Okay, so let me, let me ask a quick question then. Does, who has questions that you feel, use your own determination, that you feel are along the lines of general things that could benefit the whole group and maybe we'll take another five to 10 minutes to answer those and then we'll do what you suggest. Does that sound good? Great, okay. Um, so uh, kind of tied to, to um, that question, could you talk about uh, the balance between being lean and being like, geared for growth and was there ever a time when uh, trading you know, where you felt like you were one way or the other and being lean, we were being lean versus being geared for growth. Um, yeah, I mean, the first couple of years, I think it was always a dynamic tension. Uh, I, I mean, the lean startup thing didn't really become a thing until we've been in business for a couple of years, like that sort of general philosophy even. Um, I mean, we definitely scrambled, we definitely bootstrapped. We were, you know, I was literally withdrawing $300 from my bank account to pay early staff in Ecuador. Um, when we, it goes back to what I was saying before, when we raised our first serious round of capital, we started acting like a company that had capital in the bank. Um, I think Tyler would say this as well. I think that if I was going to start Runa all over again, I would be much leaner about a lot of things. So we did a lot of things right and we were scrappy with resources, but I wouldn't say like we were a super lean company at any point in time. That's a big lesson I took out of this. I wouldn't say that we were idiots about it either. We weren't just like blowing money on crazy stuff, uh, mostly, most of the time. Um, but yeah, that's, when, if I start another company, that will be much more who I am. And I, I don't have good lessons on like critical implementation of lean startup methodology because that wasn't even something I knew that much about, but also that was something we, by the time, the time in which we would have done that, we did an okay job, but by the time it really became something relevant in the societal narrative as a teaching, we were already in the like, let me just put it this way. Running a beverage business, you gotta deal with operations, packaging, product, distributors, growth. It's a lot of moving parts, and it's harder to be lean in that space than if you're doing online retail, et cetera. Other general audience relevant questions? Uh, you mentioned like time management and time prioritization, mm. and, and, and how you look like this whole list of family, friends, health, yeah. like company, and then not being able to say that you're busy to anybody. Yeah. That's a point of privilege. So I'm wondering how you, what strategies you might employ to balance out or decide what you spend time on what, sure. and how to decide to move on to something. Uh, Alan Harlan taught me this and it stuck with me. So you got a pie. This pie is your life. It equates to 180 hours. And there's only so many slices you can cut it into. And Let's be real. And that's going to vary at some point or another, right? Like sometimes it might be here, sometimes it might be here. And you've got you've to pick what this pie is, and then you're going to have a list of, you know, uh, work, well, let's cross out. For me, it's meditate, friends. Whatever it is. And then within each of those, you know, there's, I mean, Tyler was my, Tyler's still my friend. That was number one, you know. Um, I put my partner, my romantic partner, because that was something I wanted to prioritize. And then, you know, we'll call him Steve. You want to prioritize those relationships. As you get out of college and as you start a startup, you cannot be best friends with everyone that you were friends with in college. I still have many, many close friends from Brown, not as many as when I left. So this, like hiking is a great example. I love hiking, it's important to me. Find a way to fit the critical things at the top of this list in to this. 
when, whatever that is, there's always going to be some time and, you know, week to week, you might not be able to keep that. Like there will be some weeks where you just work full on, but you can carve something out. I took a photography class when I was here because I love photography. I took a RISD continuing ed. Make sure you always have the priorities that fit in here. Make sure you have as much of a morning routine as you can. And when you have extra time, that's when you get to do the other fun stuff. But as a side note to that, ask yourself, what are, what are the things that would be nice to do, but I need to ask myself the question, is this really worth doing? That's my general answer. But you brought up something else I just want to dive into for a second. Um, privilege. Running a startup is a privilege thing. I'm super excited that there's, relative to what I see, some, some diversity across a couple spectrums in here. But you know, this is Brown University. However you're affiliated with it, it's one of the most privileged institutions in the world. Um, and I just want, I'm not gonna go into this. I'm not exactly the, I'm not, I'm not like the world's foremost expert on privilege. Um, but what I will say is acknowledge it, recognize it, recognize your privilege. Don't come in like, I, I'm so sick of seeing BS like up from the bootstrap stories when actually you had a hundred grand from working at an investment bank and your parents loaned you 200 grand and actually you were maybe born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Don't go out on a microphone and say, hi, I'm Dan, I had a silver spoon in my mouth. But acknowledging your privilege and working to support others who are not as privileged as you or don't start off with as much privilege as you in whatever way is really critical um, because it can come off as so, so ignorant to pretend that you've built everything by the bootstraps. I'm not gonna get into politics, but it was that whole misunderstanding about Obama's you built this line in the 08 election or whatever it is. That's what I'm talking about here, and I just wanted to at least recognize that elephant in the room. Any other big audience, sort of general audience questions? All right, oh, last one. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, like, I bet there are so many stages in your, like, company, like, from, like, idea, startup, production, growth, like, um, even, like, uh, in another comment, uh, which stage do you think the most, is the most challenging? For, you? for me personally, or for yeah. Runa, or? For Runa. I think that really sort of like that stage of operational growth, going from, okay, we're scrappy, we're starting a product, we're running to a bunch of stores to, man, we gotta work with distribution, we gotta figure out trucking and logistics and getting product on time and all the nuts and bolts regulations. And that's sort of like, growing pain stage when you're not like a big company yet, but you're being treated like a real company, particularly on the sort of like operational financial system side, that transition period from pure startup to scaling company, that was the trickiest one. All right, let's eat some food. I'm gonna hang around here until Deb gets here for a sec and I'm really excited to share and talk more with y'all. Thank you so much.